thanks for uh, your uh, time this morning. Um, hopefully uh, today what we'll be able to do in the next 45 minutes is give you a little bit of our point of view um, about a couple of things. Uh, there's really three topics that I thought might be useful to uh, share and you know, hopefully engage in a dialogue um, with you about. And that is first, what makes a good virtual agent? The second is actually to broaden your view of what a virtual agent looks like. And um, finally, to give our view on what's next and where actually more innovation is going to be required to achieve the vision that we all have um, for virtual agents. So with that, you um, might be surprised to actually see somebody from Xerox up here talking about virtual agents. Um, but the reality is that Xerox has always been about um, engineering the way the world works to make work better. That's what the plain paper copier was about. And today, we're actually a very different company uh, than we were um, since our founding over 50 years ago. And um, rather than me tell you a little bit about it, we have a video that I'd like to play that um, I think lays it out pretty well. The world's becoming more and more connected, but that's also bringing new challenges. As more businesses operate at a global scale, they also need to provide experiences that are unique and personal. As systems become more open, they also need to be more secure. As big data gets bigger, so does the need for precise, actionable insights. Adapting to such challenges and helping businesses and governments, big and small, adopt new ways of working is what Xerox is all about. We call it business engineering. We bring our experience in energy, business process, analytics, automation, and human-centric design to everything we do. We design and run complex systems and process billions of transactions for thousands of enterprises while bringing precision to each and every individual interaction. It's how we come up with meaningful innovations that make a real difference to our customers and their customers. So a dad makes his daughter's soccer game because of faster traffic. A nurse anticipates patient complications because of predictive care modeling. A teacher helps a struggling student because of personalized evaluation. A manager in Kansas City saves the client presentation in Kuala Lumpur. A working mom interacts successfully with her bank online. It's something we've been doing for over 75 years starting with engineering the way the world shared information. And since then, we've engineered the way the world shops, learns, parks, publishes, serves customers, does banking, drives, crunches data, buys fast food, obtains mortgages, gets benefits, receives health care, and of course, works. We are Xerox. We're engineering the way the world works. So today we're a, div a diversified business services company. Um, we are, about half of our revenue comes from a set of diversified uh, business services ranging from HR services, where we provide um, uh, benefits planning as well as benefits and employee support and delivery, um, to healthcare, um, running state Medicaid systems, doing claims processing for healthcare companies, to providing analytics um, to hospitals to help them identify which patients are likely to be readmitted early, um, to uh, customer care. Um, we are one of the largest customer uh, care providers in the globe, actually, providing over two and a half million customer interactions daily in a variety of call centers across the, um, across the globe. Um, $5 billion in electronic tools annually, actually. Uh, uh, fast pass or easy pass on the East Coast here, if any of you use that system as a service provided by, uh, uh, provided by Xerox. And so we, have, we are investing uh, quite a bit, actually, in intelligent agent technology to support the variety of these businesses. And, and um, at PARC, uh, hopefully many of you have heard PARC, so I run uh, Xerox's, uh, Xerox PARC, the research an innovation center for Xerox on the West Coast. And we're fairly well known for um, developing some of the foundational technologies behind the personal computer, uh, behind the personal computing revolution. Um, really creating the first personal workstation, the Alto in the 1970s. Um, what you see is what you get um, editing. Um, you know, who, who here in the room remembers 
editing by entering mystery codes, right? That's, you know, Dan and I are <laughs> of the same generation with punch cards and all of those, uh, all of those, uh, all of those things. And today, we continue to innovate in a broad set of areas to support um, uh, uh, Xerox's, uh, Xerox's business. And, uh, you know, it's from that basis uh, that I want to share some of the things uh, that we're going to share today. And I actually want to start with this, um, I'm often asked to give talks about innovation as a process, how to, how to be innovative. And I use this diagram in almost, almost one of these talks because I think it's a really important point for us all to think about as innovators as we try to create virtual agents um, that meet people's needs. Because in the end, it's about that. You know, we help to develop personal computing, and I want you to notice that the word person is the first word, right? All of those technologies, what you see is what you get editing, the integration of the mouse to a graphical user interface, windowing systems, were about helping people be able to use the technologies, deploying technologies which were previously for experts to non-experts. And that, our view is that transformational innovation almost always requires bringing these three together. So, Obviously, if it's a technological-driven innovation, and at Park, that's what we are, we're a technology-driven innovation um, business, you've got to have the technology expertise and know-how. You've got to know what you're doing with the technology. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, that's actually not enough. You also have to understand people. In the end, technology is to solve a problem in their lives. What is that problem? Do you understand it? Are you delivering in the technology in a way that people can actually use it? And finally, often transformative capabilities bring with them either the opportunity for or the demand for a new uh, a model for business. And so we focus a lot on bringing those three uh, together. And so uh, I, I think we all need to remember that, um, particularly in the technology here, about uh, you know, where the technology is all about helping people, a virtual assistant to me. And so we're going to talk a little bit today about our view of um, what it's going to take. This is an example of what happens if you don't put the person first. Hi, uh, Mary. Yes, I'd like to order. This is Mr. Kelly? Uh, yes. Thank you for calling again, sir. I share your national identification number as 610-204-9998-45-54610. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I see you live at 736 Montrose Court, but you're calling from your cell phone. Are you at home? I'm just leaving work, but I'm... Oh, we can deliver to Bob's Auto Supply. That's at 175 Lincoln Avenue, yes? No. I'm on my way home. How do you know all this stuff? We just got wired into the system, sir. Oh, well, I'd like to order a couple of your double meat special pizzas. Sure thing. There'll be a new $20 charge for this, sir. What do you mean? Sir, the system shows me that your medical records indicate that you have high blood pressure and extremely high cholesterol. Luckily, we have a new agreement with your national health care provider that allows us to sell you double meat pies as long as you agree to waive all future claims of clients. <laughs> do you agree, sir? You can sign the form when we deliver, but there is a charge for processing. The total is $67 even. $67? Well, that includes the delivery surcharge of $15 to cover the added risk to our driver of traveling through an orange zone. I live in an orange zone? Now you do. Looks like there was another robbery on Montrose yesterday. Hmm. You could say $48 if you ordered our special Sprout Submarine combo and picked it up yourself. Comes with cocoa sticks. Those are very tasty, sir. Good value, too. But I want double meat. Well, I'm sure you can afford the $67, then. You just bought those tickets to Hawaii. They weren't cheap, eh? Oh. But I see you checked out the budget beach bomb at the library last week. Hmm. Up to you, sir. All right, all right. I'll get the sprout subs. Good choice, sir. Gotta watch that waist if you're hitting the beach, eh? It's 42 inches. Wow. Man, I think the sprouts are like required. That's how much? Just between you and me, there's a $3 off coupon in this month's Total Men's Fitness magazine. Your wife Betty subscribes to that, right? Anyhow, clip that and it's $19.99 even. Whoa, looks like you maxed out on all your credit cards. <laughs> Bring cash, okay? So, is this the future we want? <laughs> Um, I, don't, uh, I don't think so. And this is what happens uh, when you don't put the person first. Um, and, um, you know, it's interesting, you know, there are more examples, right? And so, there, you know, the famous saying, right, those who don't understand history are condemned to repeat it. And this is an example of um, Time did an a article or a, you know, a, a piece on the 50 worst inventions of all time. 
and right next to Agent Orange in the list <laughs> was Clippy. <laughs> um, if we all recall Clippy, Microsoft's you know attempt at a virtual uh, at, at, at a virtual assistant, and you know I think maybe Clippy's getting a little bit of a bad rap for being ahead of its time with uh, being next to Agent Orm, but the 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 point is. How do we learn from these experiences? And I think we all need to think hard about what really makes a good virtual agent. And we have a point of view on that. And it comes down to a couple of things. That agent has to understand the system. And I'm going to talk a little bit about GDs. It's got to understand you, right? The system is whatever issue you're trying to work on, it has to have an understanding. It has to understand you. It has to understand with your context which is you at that point of time in the system. How to interact with you naturally, right, in a way that is comfortable, that feels human-like, and how to adapt over time. And so, you know, the system model is very important. If you're, if, if, um, you know, in, in, many, t in um, many day, many of the intelligent agents that we see today, things like um, Siri, Cortana, um, the system is really understanding, um, uh, uh, those, those are really about interfaces, they're really interfaces uh, to search, right? So the system is understanding how to do search, how to access information, and the system is the phone on which you're operating, right? Um, in our work, where we do uh, customer care and call centers, it's often about understanding people are calling in with a problem. So we need to build models of the device that they're calling about, the process that they're calling about resolving um, whatever. You've got to have a model of what it is you're trying to understand. Um, the next is the virtual agents, good virtual agents will understand the individual's preferences, right, and personality. How do I want to deal with this system? Um, am I someone who needs a lot of explanation you know, a technology neophyte or a technology expert? Um, how do we learn that about the user and use that to interact with them in a natural way? Obviously, context, right? What is going on? If I'm calling about a phone, is the phone on the network right now or is it off the network? Why would I want to ask a customer that question if I can tell that automatically? So getting context right. Um, and. Finally, a natural interaction that adapts over time. And this is, I'm going to talk more about this later. This is what we think is really the, one of the next four fronts of building successful virtual um, intelligent assistance. And that is, again, moving from this idea of a point series of interactions. Siri, where, uh, where's the closest Italian restaurant? To a dialogue a conversation over time. And again, we're going to talk about this more, but where, um, again, why we're investing a lot in this technology is to support our customer care business. And a diagnostic conversation to help resolve someone's problem, someone's problem is not the interface to a search. It's not a point wise, I have to understand what that person is saying now and integrate that into some search engine, but I have to actually engage in a dialogue that builds shared understanding over time because I'm trying to diagnose a problem with you in a collaborative way. And that, we think, is really one of the, uh, the next forefronts. And why do we think, um, you, know, and th this, you know, some of these challenges, if you go back to the example of Clippy, this was one of the challenges of Clippy. Clippy treated everybody the same. And, they treated everybody, and it treated everybody the same over time because the technology wasn't ready to actually be able to fully understand context, to interact with you and learn from those interactions and adapt over time. And so, why do we think we can make better virtual agents now? Well, it's fundamentally about the, the waves of technology change that um, have come over the past 20 years and that are coming now. And so, these are you know, the fundamental waves that we see is we, computing has gotten more and more personalized and connected, right? From mainframes to PCs, the internet connecting us smartphones, which are really the first personal computer, right? It's mine, I wear it all the time. It's available to understand my context. And the next big waves that are really going to take us, um, advance these capabilities, we see are the, inter the Internet of Things. Because the Internet of Things is about actually giving us a tremendous understanding of context. 
right? What is occurring out in the world right now? When I'm in China and I want to exercise in the morning, what's the state of the air outside? Is it polluted or not? Should I exercise outside or stay inside? By the way, in Beijing, stay inside. <laughs> um, uh, but this ability, you know, we think this idea of the internet of things, the analogy that I like to make for people is what Google did for us in many ways was expand the human memory to be limitless, right? I, you know, I'm a, I'm a geek, I'm a scientist, I learn things like Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, molecules in a mole of material. Um, but I don't have to remember those things now. My brain, my memory is infinite, right? I can look it up and within two seconds find it. The analogy for the Internet of Things is my body becoming infinite, my senses, right? I can sense what is occurring in the world wherever it's occurring. I understand the state of, again, if I'm in a diagnostic conversation with a customer, why am I asking, a question, why am I asking the person questions about the state of the machine instead of interrogating it um, um, directly? Um, what is going on out in the world? And you combine that with uh, machine intelligence, or what I like to call narrow AI, right? So the dreams of broad AI, right? The Turing complete computer who can engage on, in me as, with a dialogue over any subject. And I can't tell the difference between that and a human. We're still a bit away from that. This idea of narrow intelligence, where computers in context can have the ability to think read, see, hear, act, speak. I mean, we see so many people here today um, uh, with automated speech recognition technologies are amazing, right? I can buy a $129 camera that when I press the shutter and take a picture of you, it decides when to take the picture to wait till you smile, right? I mean, it is phenomenal, the types of uh, in intelligence. And so these are the capabilities um, that are creating us that, that we are getting from these technology changes, the capabilities are, again, that computers can analyze and decide, and that it's ubiquitous, everywhere, everything, always on, connected. So I think these trends of Internet of Things and machine intelligence are what are really going to enable us um, to uh, realize this world of, of virtual agents. And that's part of a larger set of changes, actually, that those technology waves are enabling. Um, and, uh, you know, I think this is a, a, a useful, a simple but useful model. What are all these changes about are giving us the ability to have personalized, real-world, real-time optimization, right? This is what I expect. I mean, we've be, we become trained to expect it. I open up, again, my cell phone and I search for coffee shops. Um, it doesn't give me the list of too many coffee shops in the road. It knows where I'm at, in the world rather. It knows where I'm at and gives me the ones within in six blocks. It's a personalized real world, real time optimization. And this ability to sense what is going on in the world and to understand what as a human my intent is gives me the ability to do this. And so this is, again, a philosophy which we're taking into all of our business, uh, into the business process services that we provide. Um, individuals want personalized recommendations for their benefits planning every year when you have to go as an employee and select what are the right benefits. I should be able to help you make that choice based upon understanding your needs. Um, if you're a city, how do we dynamically, we do dynamic pricing for parking, helping and help uh, um, cities design and route their transportation services, the buses, the trains, Again, dynamically based upon the state of traffic, the state of usage. Um, businesses, how do we help businesses um, um, meet the needs of their customers in that personalized and individualized way? And so, you know, and virtual assistants are very obviously just an example of that, right? Of my assistant, personalized, real world, real time uh, optimization. And so we see this um, as an coming waves to really transform the customer experience. And, I, and our view is that we're at the beginning of a massive set of changes. And I'm going to give a few examples of, of what's occurring today. Um, and I'm going to use this quote um, that I enjoy from William Gibson. He's a, a science fiction author. If you're not familiar with him, he's very good. Um, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed, right? So there are the signs of the coming change if you look for them. And so. Um, this is a, you know, an early example, again, that 
we're working on, and if you're interested, I encourage you to go out during one of the breaks and you know talk to the folks. We do have a, a, a booth here from um, WDS, a Xerox company that is delivering um, virtual agent technology into the customer care business. And this is one of the, this idea, again, of personalized, customized at the point of need uh, uh, services and building on this ability for computers um, to have intelligence in a domain. And uh, you know, as I said, we have a, a large number of um, call centers, about 50,000 actual customer care agents across the globe helping customers resolve their problems. And so we developed a set of technologies um, around optimizing that, uh, uh, that experience. And that was really about identifying who are the best call center agents. What is it that they do? How do they resolve problems? Capturing that, labeling that data, using machine learning to then build recommendation systems for new agents to train them or for agents who haven't seen a problem before. And then we've taken that technology and now not only taking it, taking it out of the call center, but again, using that corpus, right? Millions of transactions a day of knowledge how do we give that directly to the end user? So today through a chat interface, um, obviously in a style that's delivered differently than you would to a call center agent, but relying on that knowledge that we have built and the machine learning algorithms which have helped us to understand um, how, what is the right diagnostic procedure to giving that to the end user. So this is the virtual agent uh, uh, technology which we are uh, uh, announcing and are delivering um, early next year. And, and again, how to do that in a natural language way, in a conversation that builds shared understanding over time, not simply going through a diagnostic tree. Um, and so these are the kinds of capabilities um, that are coming in the world. And of course, you know, that's about helping people with a problem or um, where um, they're trying to, they know they're trying to get a task done and they're looking for help. Um, Examples we saw yesterday, my wave was the, the great uh, keynote, um, uh, which I enjoyed um, yesterday, is actually about going out in the world and not when a customer knows they have a problem or a situation, but helping them um, much more embedded into their lives, right? Putting the customer first again to manage the relationship with the brand. Another example, again, out in the real world, now, again, I want you to think about virtual agents a little differently because I think, I think there's a broader view here that can be very useful is um, we, we deliver, again, as part of our, we have a, um, a uh, corporate marketing services, again, as part of our business uh, process outsourcing, and we provide digital signage um, to businesses. And we've begun to make those very personalized, right? Tailored to the customer demographics, right? Which differ by time of day. What's the subway traffic um, look like during the day in Manhattan? versus who's on the subways at midnight? Should the signs change in response to that? Um, the day of the week, the geographic location. And of course, we're coming to a point where they will adapt to me personally, right? When I get close enough <laughs> that uh, uh, my phone is detected, right, and there's a communication that they will adapt um, to me. That is a virtual agent who's understanding your context at the point of need, at the point of time, and delivering a unique bespoke experience to you. And so it's not only about customer care and support, it's actually about how we're interacting with things um, in the real world. And again, we see this in um, you know, Xerox um, uh, on the technology side of our business, uh, you know, as I said, which is still about half of our business. Um, our, our printers have actually become self-aware systems that are constantly monitoring their state. Color is one of the very hard things to maintain. A human eye is very sensitive to color. And so we have capabilities that are in real time, sensing the color, measuring that on every page, and maintaining it. And it turns out also to personalize that. Because, you know, I'm a, you know, I don't know if there's any photographers in the room, you know, there was always this, you know, do you want a Kodachrome red or do you want a Fuji film green? You know, how you want your color balance um, to look. And again, personalizing that, understanding your preference and maintaining it over time. Again, so these are intelligent agents that are embedded in products to improve our experience. And of course, I think that you know, one of the best examples today in our consumer lives 
is Nest, right? Nest is an intelligent agent. It is trying to understand my preference for temperature, and it's trying to understand the context, right? What is happening in the world outside? Is it warmer? Is it colder? Is the sun coming up? Is it going down? Do I come home every day at 5 p.m.? Do I come home at 7 p.m.? And adapt and satisfy my needs without it. So this idea of products and services and offerings that embed an intelligent agent in him to adapt to and meet um, my needs is, we think, a, a profound type of intelligent agents that will significantly transform customer experience. So we see it touching from the whole way from the product itself, the offering, the capability in the field, to how we provide support um, uh, for uh, customers um, when they're having problems, to how they tune the experience to meet their needs um, in between. And we see that the, the next wave, and I've really already touched about this, one of the core challenges is, in many ways, today's technologies what they are providing is a point-wise interaction. Again, Siri, Cortana, all these things that we're very familiar with, they are trying to understand at a point in time, what did I say, what was my utterance, what do I want, and enough about my context to, to meet those needs. If you think about it, right, as human beings, we engage in conversations and we create shared meaning, right? We engage in a dialogue that builds on, on each other. And if you want to get any complex problem solving done, that's required. And so that's the next wave that we see is moving to this idea of a conversation that is about a collaborative task-based problem solving. And so what do we need to do? Um, it's about creating then a shared understanding between the system and user. So, you have to have a conversation that uses both natural language and, 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 and affect, right? Some sort of interactive style, right? And it's important, you know, one of ours, we've gone out and we've done ethnographic studies and of people and how they want to interact with systems. Um, it will be, you actually don't want to ha the computer to have the affect of a person because you can't keep it up and it'll be obviously fake. And that turns people off. So you don't want to pretend you're something you're not. On the other hand, you want to have a little bit of, a, of a empathy towards what is occurring for that person um, um, right then. You know, so simple things like you know, the, our automated chatbot, um, you know, someone says, I'm having this problem. Oh, I'm sorry you're having that problem. Let me see if I can help you, right? So that A fact and tone that is a natural interactive style. Um, the other is having a model that represents the state of the system and the user's history of actions. Again, if you get this idea of building knowledge over time, implicit in that is a model that evolves over time where new information is added to it. And again, this is very different than in many ways, much of the, the virtual assistants today, they have a static model. Um, 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 a virtual, imagine a virtual agent that where you were um, uh, uh, trying to make a hotel reservation. Well. That virtual agent has a model of a, of a hotel reservation. It knows there's a number of people, right? Number of rooms, the night, you know, the location. And in that dialogue, it's filling out that static model. But in a diagnostic process um, to resolve a customer's problem with a cell phone, there is no static single record model that can occur. Instead, I'm gonna build a complex model over time that adapts. What, okay, what, what is the model of phone? What is the problem that you're having? I'm going to ask you questions to resolve um, uh, that, that problem. And so this idea, again, of not only understanding what people are saying, but building a model of the world around the problem that you're doing and dynamically adapt and learning over time are core capabilities that are going to enable this. Now, that ability is um, not going to be perfect. Um, and it certainly isn't going to be perfect the first time that you do that. So when I start to try to learn and engage with a customer in a dialogue to understand what's their problem, again, the cell phone, my internet connection isn't uh, working. Hmm, well, you know, do you, do you, are you connected to Wi-Fi? I don't know. Well, do you see a little symbol up in the corner that looks like this? Um, 
and we'll go through this dialogue, and eventually it's not going to work. And so what do you do? So we think it's a very important, and it's going to frustrate your customers. Again, Clippy. Um, um, so we don't want to end up next stage in orange. We're, we want to do a little better um, than that. We think this idea of automated learning with graceful failover to humans. So the idea that you'll be in this dialogue, again, every dialogue that you're in is a learning opportunity. Provides labeled data, which I can put into my machine learning algorithm and improve over time. But when I, the system recognizes that it doesn't understand something or it's incapable of, of solving, how do you seamlessly roll over to a human and insert them into that, into that diagnostic process? And again, that does two things. It keeps the customer happy because they haven't wasted all of their time. They're going to seamlessly roll over to a human. And now that human is going to resolve that problem and you're going to label that data and you're going to put it right back in your machine learning algorithm and you're going to get better over time. And so this world, this vision, which we believe is very possible of, again, me engaging in a dialogue with a, com with a computational agent who can build shared understanding over time and solve a problem, will become true, but it won't be true at day one. And how do we get, how do we use the interaction itself to make it better and better? So we think this is a very important modality in these types of systems as we learn. And, you know, we're not alone. Um, Interactions, who's here today, uh, uses exactly this uh, model of what they call human-assisted understanding um, uh, in their automated speech rec recognition technology to combine the best of humans and computers. And so it's an interesting point, you know, kind of a, 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 a mental model and metaphor, if you think about it, is um, we're moving from a world where um, computers helped humans to humans helping computers. <laughs> help other humans. Um, and of course, um, uh, Facebook M, if you're familiar with that, is um, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, in a beta launch, in a limited launch, but it's their assistant technology. I can ask M anything. Um, my, my son's birthday tomorrow, my son's birthday tomorrow, what's the, he's nine years old, what's the hottest toy for nine years old and where do I buy one? And M will try to help you resolve that. And it's a combination, again, of AI virtual assistants and people. And again, using those interactions and labeling that data to find out what people really want and how do you resolve um, um, those types of problems. So, uh, you know, for those of you who are, um, you know, out looking for these kinds of technologies, um, I think it's a very important kind of capability, a system design that you ought to be looking for. And for those of you developing the systems, um, our view is this is a very important stepping stone to achieve the vision that we want. The other thing, uh, another, you know, adapting, naturally interacting with me, a key aspect is trust and respecting privacy. And so we've seen a variety of, you know, yesterday and some, you know, um, comments even this morning on the video um, uh, about it. And here's a, uh, this is a, a set of survey work that we did at, 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 at Xerox. We'll release a broader uh, view of it. Um, either the end of this year, I think in the end, by the end of this year, but I wanted to pull some examples from it because I found it very useful is, you know, the question about are people comfortable with suppliers using their data um, to communicate and adapt their products to you? And, you know, the interesting thing is only 35% of the people are comfortable, right? You get the 50% if you include a bit nervous and, you know, half of them are, you know, concerned or will actively avoid sharing. So we know this is an issue for our customers. So how do we, how do, we do this in a way, again, that is natural um, um, for them? And you know, one of the ways we think is, again, in this process of a conversation, right? It, uh, you know, when I meet you for the first time, you don't ask me where I live and all this personal information about me. But if in a dialogue where we're, you, know, you have a conversation, you meet somebody, and um, you start talking about your kids, and then you say, oh, you know, my kids go to this school. Where do your kids go to school? It's a natural piece of the conversation. And so this idea, again, of engaging in conversations with people and only asking them to reveal more personal information or when you need to, again, that's what builds confidence and trust. Again, I think Geraldine talked about kind of using the normal mores of human behavior and interaction yesterday in her in, in her keynote, and I, I think that's a key one. So, you know, this is an example of a conversation where that may, may happen, right? Is, you know, uh, this is, 
you know, I have a problem with my phone, maybe it's the network, um, you know, can you access from your home network? Oh, I'm not at home. So I, I didn't ask them where they're at, I gave them information, they responded. Oh, do you mind sharing with me? Sure, here's where I'm at, because now the human understands why I need to know. And so this process, again, of building trust and respecting privacy through a dialogue and, at, and having a model, again, of what is the information you need now and asking for it only when you need it is an important um, uh, part of interacting naturally. Another key area that we're working on, um, and that not only we are, but you know, many in the world, is, and you see here, this is a DARPA, which is the uh, uh, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. So they, unlike Al Gore, they actually did bring us the internet. Um, um, you know, they fund a lot of the fundamental long-range research, and um, we do a lot of work um, with DARPA, all non-classified. Um, a big focus uh, there is how do we do analytics on encrypted data? So today the model is, right, oh, I'm going to encrypt your data, but, you know, I'm going to unencrypt it so that I can actually perform an analysis. What if we could tell people, store your data, and it's encrypted, and we never unencrypt it. So the whole data isn't, but there are analytics procedures that you can run on that data to help me help you. And so, you know, the, the, there's a set of mathematics um, um, behind this um, and, a, and a set of, there are some theoretical ways to do this mathematically that are incredibly computationally intensive that don't scale. The trick is finding the ways that actually give you security, but also a scale. So this is an active area of research for us um, as, as well as for others. And, you know, I'll give you an example, right, is if, um, um, let's say you've got everybody's, you've got a, rec a set of records about people and you record their income. It's pretty personal data, how much you make every year. Well, if what I really want to know is the average income over a set of people, right, you know, by location or something, um, I could add, I could randomly add arbitrary amounts to their income and I won't change the average, right? So if I add white noise to a set of data, the average isn't changed. So these, you know, that's a simple example to give you a metaphor of the kinds of analytical techniques that are coming. Um, and uh, that, again, where more innovation is required, these are areas that we're investing. You know, I would hope to see others in the world also, um, also uh, you know, contributing to those, those kinds of technologies because we're all going to be better off if we can do these types of capabilities for our customers. Um, so hopefully what I've been able to do today is um, give you our point of view that uh, the next wave in intelligent assistance is an intelligent agent that works with you collaboratively in a task-based problem, solve, task problem solving. And to do that, that agent will have to understand the system, you, your context, how to interact naturally, and how to adapt over time. And hopefully I've also given you a view of how intelligent agents are gonna show up in a variety of ways, embedded in products and services, to customer care agents, um, and giving you a little bit of our view of uh, where some of the innovation is required in terms of technologies and user interactions for collaborative task-based problem solving, um, new ways to build trust with users, and new types of analytics and uh, contextual models that preserve privacy. Uh, thank you.